Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the first of this week's Best of BlackRock series. Uh, today, we're honoured to have Evie Hambro, who's the co-manager of BlackRock World Mining Trust, uh, in the room. Um, Evie has been part of the natural resources team at BlackRock since the trust launched in 1993, which is 30 years ago. Um, World Mining Trust offers a, a unique way for investors to get exposure to the mining and metals industry, as well as the breadth and depth of the BlackRock management team. In addition, as I'm sure we'll touch on in a minute, the trust harnesses many of the structural levers that investment trusts can offer, including gearing and an ability to take longer term views through private unlisted investments. If you do have any questions for Evie, please enter them using the Q&A function on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, and I'll try and cover them off at the end of the presentation. So, uh, without further ado, over to you, Evie. Thanks, Billy. Can you hear me? Yep. Great, fantastic. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for dialing in today. Thanks to Kepler for for hosting this. Uh, it's a great honour to be able to talk about the the trust um, to to all of you. So, um, I'm in control of the slides here. So, we'll just uh, move on from the first one. Um, and the second one, and uh, go into in, into where we are, which I think is what most people um, want to kind of focus on. So, um, um, what's happened, um, and uh, and I guess uh, yeah, what are we seeing as next um, in in this space? I think the first thing is, you know, we've been through uh, obviously a, a, a number of years of some absolutely spectacular returns um, from 2016. Yeah, the sector has a really rebuilt confidence in itself and I think uh, confidence within investors. Uh, we've seen some, you know, some really robust changes in the way that capital is allocated. Uh, we've seen some changes in, in management, uh, substantially improved returns, both on the capital base and returns flowing through um, back to uh, investors. Uh, and also, um, I guess the, the last thing I suppose is to, is to do with balance sheets. The sector having you know, had gearing, high levels of gearing for, for many decades, is now got an, a, a very, very strong uh, support base um, in terms of its balance sheets, which obviously gives you know, a far greater degree of resilience uh, in when when you know the, the cyclicality of cyclical of adversity um, comes along. Moving on from uh, from the, those kind of fundamentals, you know, what are we seeing at a more macro level? Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that the reopening of, uh, of the Chinese economy um, that started with such gusto um, has hit a few air pockets. Yeah, and I guess those air pockets are more about uncertainty than, than anything else. You know, I think some investors had been leaning towards an, uh, a kind of policy-based support mechanism for economic growth um, that hasn't transpired as expected. It, it's been very targeted rather than wide-ranging. Wide uh, it's been designed to support the kind of long-term initiatives um, that the, the government has rather than kind of broad-based uh, economic drivers. And I think that's been disappointing to, to some. I think the other element with regards to China has been that, that I guess we're seeing a, a change in leadership in terms of commodities demand, one from you know, residential um, based housing uh, and industrial building construction to one that's being led by energy transition. And this will take a few years um, to, to play out. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the support is there, just not necessarily at the scale that some people have been hoping, uh, hope, uh, hoping for. I think with regards to the underlying fundamentals in the commodity markets, uh, the conditions remain extremely tight. Uh, if anything, if China had rebounded, uh, um, at the levels that people had desired, we would have a, a terrifying commodity market environment right now with the, just the supply side being you know, absurdly tight um, and, and, and unable to, to accommodate the kind of demand aspirations that some people had been looking for. So if anything, this is actually quite healthy. Um, when you look back into the past and you see the kind of, um, I guess, the, the China miss uh, with regards to commodities demand growth, um, you've seen far bigger gyrations in, in the valuation of securities attached to commodity markets and commodity prices themselves and what we've seen, you know, in, in these moves, which just shows you the level of tightness um, and I guess fear that some people have around the kind of medium to long term imbalances, which we'll move on to uh, a little bit later. 
Um, the carbon transition, um, that's obviously a key driver for demand growth um, over the long term, but as we'll also touch on, and as we've been talking about more recently, it's not just the end markets that we're seeing carbon transition going on. We're seeing the supply side uh, respond. So the moves to decarbonize the production of raw materials that are so essential for the transition. You know, this is a this is a process that's really kicking off at scale. Uh, we're seeing huge amounts of money now being baked into capital expenditure plans uh, within the supply chain, uh, which is very encouraging with regards to the kind of long term margins that are going to be attached to this. If anything, the economic rationale is now starting starting to become much clearer um, with, with regards to these investment decisions, whereas before it was more around, you know, just doing the right thing. I think now there's very much a, an economic justification for, for much of these investments and the returns there appear to be appear to be growing. Um, I've touched on the last point, which is more about the company fundamentals, uh, which remain you know, very, very strong um, indeed. So just going through the points from 2022, I think this chart is pretty self-explanatory. You know, obviously we started um, the year very strong. We had then had a Russia, Russia Ukraine situation develop, which further tightened markets. And then obviously the, the, the ongoing lockdowns, um, kind of zero COVID policy events in China um, disrupted um, people's growth expectations for commodity markets from kind of um, May onwards. And then we had this, uh, uh, I guess, hopes around the big reopening of China as we move into Q4, driving these very strong returns um, uh, in those last few months of the year. Uh, if we compare that to 2023, what's happened so far, again, you know, we've seen commodity markets trading, you know, around that kind of zero level in terms of price moves um, for most of the year. Um, but we've also, uh, but we've seen that kind of underperformance come through of this sector relative to broader markets. And I think this is very much the case for most parts of the financial um, market as a whole, where, you know, there's been lots of commentary written around the kind of the great seven, the big tech names in the US that, you know, without which um, returns for broader markets would be, you know, very much in negative territory compared to, to where they are. The, the, the concentration of return risk and the scale that has driven this out performance has been very much um, targeted at that small number of companies. So actually, I think in the face of things and given the kind of, the, I guess, the sentiment factor as well, it's actually quite surprising how well um, you know, when you compare it to the past, how well the sector has has held up. And I think this in part is due to those very strong fundamentals in regards to the balance sheets, which have preserved that uh, or protected the sector um, in, in the face of some of these nearer term, uh, more negative signals that the, 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 the broader markets have had to deal with. Um, in terms of commodity prices, and you can see this very clearly, that last point I was making, you look at, you know, iron ore um, prices have been very, very sticky around that kind of $120 a ton uh, level for, you know, 2022, 2023. If anything, you know, we're now on the cusp of earnings upgrades for most of those broad diversified mining companies going into, into year end. Yeah, you know, prices have been a lot higher than most people have been modeling. You know, iron ore prices were meant to be well below $100 a ton um, by year end with regards to kind of consensus opinions and, and obviously trading a lot higher um, than that now spot prices in today's market 121 um, dollars uh, right now you know copper again um, very resilient around that four dollar level uh, copper price is 370 right now being above four dollars for most of the year most of the first part of the year so kind of average prices are going to be pretty good um, and therefore obviously you know healthy towards margins nickel's been through a much more kind of traumatic decline you know the growth in supply from you know uh, indonesia in particular has really un unsettled the supply and demand imbalances despite the growth we've seen from the battery space uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that continues to uh, to, to play out um, over the next few years and I think the oil market everybody's a, a much better expert on oil than, than than I am but obviously you know we've got this very tragic situation playing out in the Middle East right now we've got ongoing supply disruption from Russia Ukraine you know really that kind of walk premium in the oil market is very much um, back um, and, and if anything yeah there's going to be some upside skew, I suppose, um, towards that. We've also seen the support mechanisms mechanisms put in place by OPEC, you know, where clearly they're not prepared to tolerate low prices and therefore keep supply out of the market, but don't want prices to go too high uh, based on, you know, supply disruption. Um, and so I think they'll be managing that uh, pretty clearly. 
with regards to China, I've made some comments earlier on. You know, we've obviously been seeing lots of um, things over the last few years. Um, the, these newspaper clippings, you know, go back to uh, 2022. You know, where we where we kind of are you know, coming towards the end of the kind of uh, enforced lockdowns, zero COVID policy, you know, economic picking up, support mechanisms put in place, uh, and then some more kind of disappointing numbers over the summer, um, leading to where we are right now. Which I guess China, China continues to be an area of, um, you know, I guess, a, a different differences of opinion within within the, within the broader market. Um, still the world's largest commodity consumer, so what goes on there is still very relevant and important um, towards the area that we're invested in. Uh, when you look at the um, the energy transition, you know all of the things that are intact. If anything, they're going; they have been going a lot faster. You know, clearly the situation in Europe last year and desire to move away from um, the kind of uh, Russian fossil fuel uh, dependency has accelerated the move towards uh, renewables in 2022. You know, sales of electric vehicles have surpassed all expectations um, globally uh, over the last few years. So clearly that transition is is very much underway. And if anything happening at, at a very, very high degree of, uh, of speed. You know, today's economic situation and higher rates are probably going to you know, cool things down a bit in the near term, but I think the direction of travel there is, is very clear. So the end outcome being that the, the, the energy transition being the kind of key driver of commodities demand growth over the next kind of 10 to 20 years, um, that theme is very much um, intact. You know, this whole kind of, uh, I guess, taxonomy of you know, swapping fossil fuels uh, for, for metals is very is, is very much one that uh, you, you just keep reading about. Um, with regards to the government support packages, you know, we're seeing again, I guess, more and more uh, initiatives around this. What's interesting outside of the big headline numbers around the US IRA, European Green Deal, what's going on in Japan, uh, and so on, it's interesting to see the kind of more nuanced headlines coming through where security of supply measures um, are increasingly uh, being uh, reported on within the media. It was interesting to read uh, in this weekend's uh, Sunday Times uh, about um, the move to not only for security secure uh, supply, but secure supply of uh, materials that have been decarbonized, referencing the term around green metals uh, to meet the needs of the energy transition. Uh, and I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if this is a, a, a theme that starts to kind of trump um, the, 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 the kind of more uh, bigger headlines that we've seen over the last few years. So not only is it around physical security of supply, but security of supply of, of commodities that are actually going to accelerate the transition and how things are produced is going to become you know, um, uh, much more important in, in end consumers' minds. With regards to the companies uh, and spending, you can see on the left-hand side here, this uh, red and yellow chart, you know, still very, very much driven by uh, sustaining CapEx. And one thing that we're going to do next year is update this. Uh, we're going to get some help to update this um, to see whether or not a lot of this growth in the yellow area is actually much more um, around decarbonization CapEx. I think it's going to be important to, to break that out as a, as a distinct area uh, within overall spend. What we're seeing now at the company level is, uh, I guess, increased competition in terms of uh, capital allocation uh, frameworks, where um, the competition between spend on decarbonization is right up there with uh, spend on growth or or, or, uh, or new asset capex. You know, a lot of these numbers are now being baked into um, into the kind of prospects over the near to medium term, which is which is seeing a rise in overall expenditure, but it's again it's putting more pressure on the supply side because as every dollar is allocated away from growth um, towards other things, either shareholder returns or, or decarbonization and maintenance and so on, that means that the gap between supply and demand over the medium term um, becomes bigger, um, which is obviously quite a scary uh, prospect. In terms of some of the uh, supply side challenges, um, this is one we've just updated recently. You can see this is the world's biggest copper producer, Chile. Uh, you can see that they're how difficult, you know, this, these are the people with all of the competitive advantages with regards to the mineral resource wealth, uh, developed infrastructure and so on. Just uh, you can see how hard it is for them to be able to grow production. You, know, you can see that you know, years in the past have had much, much higher levels of output um, than, than they have had uh, more, more recently. Um, so those supply side challenges becoming in increasingly problematic in terms of maintaining current levels of production, let alone growing to meet the needs of the energy transition. 
in terms of um, the kind of the broader picture, this has been updated more recently. Um, yeah, one of the things I'm always amazed by is just the size of the imbalances. Now, clearly, the one thing we know for sure is that these imbalances ca cannot physically uh, transpire. Uh, you can't have negative consumption balances. Yeah, it's just not possible. I mean, it's going to be you know, unhappy consumers because they won't be able to get hold of the physical inventory. Um, you can also see the growth numbers in, in terms of the amount of um, uh, new supply that's going to be needed to meet the demand just from the clean energy transition. Now, you know, these are enormous, enormous numbers, you know, Wood Mackenzie three times, BHP three times, Bloomberg five times, et cetera, over the next kind of 17 years. You know, these are very, very, very big numbers and, and physically almost impossible to achieve in terms of supply growth because the, the physical assets are just not there to be able to meet this. Now, clearly against this, there's going to be some decline in demand from other sources and whether that's offsets in uh, Chinese residential uh, construction and so on. So the, the net number in terms of need of supply growth is probably going to be smaller but the scale is is the scary thing it's just not going to be possible to grow the supply side uh, based upon what we know in the pipeline in terms of uh, of assets that could be uh, could go into production it's just not going to be able to meet you know it's even some of these lowest numbers so i do think that this is a you know very very supportive background with regards to uh, the outlook um, gold, we've been increasingly asked more questions around gold uh, of late. Um, you know, this is an area that tends to kind of uh, wax and wane in terms of popularity of debate and conversation. You know, you can clearly see the shifting fortunes there with regards to what's driving uh, gold. Uh, and the different colors represent different factors that correlate to the price moves. And you can see that the, the majority of those are linked to uh, US rates and, uh, and the US dollar. Um, and they tend to be the biggest drivers in terms of ex explanatory factors for moves in the gold price. I think what's on the right hand side of the page, uh, I think that's a, to us a really interesting one you know the difference between you know what retail investors have been doing in terms of the this is a US based gold ETF well predominantly US based gold ETFs um, uh, versus the actual gold price itself and you know what we t are tending to see is more and more central banks have been buying gold um, recently and we've seen some very very strong numbers coming through um, there uh, you know it's so <laughs> highlighting the question what do they know that the retail investors um, don't know um, in terms of valuations, um, I guess this is the um, both an opportunity and a disappointment. Um, but the first one really relates to, to, to debt. The sector continues to be very well managed with regards to um, leverage, you know, which obviously is a, a hugely supportive factor when you do get periods of economic uncertainty that you know, generate negative sentiment towards um, the sector and I guess also to demand. You know, the sector can be, continues to be incredibly conservatively financed, which is in complete contrast to where it used to be. You know, looking at that right hand side of the, the chart, it was frequent to see the resources sector, you know, with kind of one and a half to, times to up to kind of two times net debt to, to, to EBITDA, which would have, you know, put it in some of the more kind of higher risk category uh, with regards to indebtedness. We, you know, obviously, the moves since 2016 to repay that debt have been very, very successful, um, leaving the sector conservatively financed and therefore lower risk than it has been um, in the past. And what's been disappointing is despite the fact it's lower risk the valuation multiples on the companies haven't expanded you know the chart on the left hand side goes back to 1991 uh, and you can see that multiples today are, are as low or have been lower than the sector you know of, uh, of, of over 30 years ago so despite the the moves to improve um, the kind of risk characteristics and their pay off the debt and capital allocation frameworks we haven't seen that expansion in multiple play out uh, which has been disappointing um, I think we've also been doing quite a lot of uh, narrative um, with with uh, with clients and media more recently uh, around two things. One is the, on the right hand side of the page, you'll see dividend yields. Um, the dividends in this sector continue to be very strong indeed. Uh, you know, substantial premiums to broader markets, a bit lower than the peaks of, uh, that free cash flow was generating a couple of years ago, and obviously that will play out into the trust's overall dividend in uh, this year and next year with regards to the income availability. You know, we are very much you know, aligned with the underlying investments. But I think when you think about the, the brown to green initiatives, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise us to see 
more and more coverage of this, you know, the essential nature of the materials supply chain in terms of meeting the net zero uh, transition uh, initiatives globally. You know, this area is often, you know, viewed with a degree of complacency. And, and I guess the, 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 the thing that, um, you know, people tend to view is that commodities will always be there. Well, without investment, uh, without better pricing, they won't be. But I think the thing that the, the thing that's also been missed is, is the decarbonization initiatives that the companies themselves are going through. You know, we're seeing huge moves to to remove, you know, this kind of high carbon intensity um, from the hard to abate sectors within the supply chain, which will assist the energy transition uh, as a whole. Now, is it right that the companies continue to trade at such low multiples when they are delivering such an essential role? And I think that that's something that's going to be, you know, will play out in terms of uh, investor thinking uh, in the near term. Certainly, the access to much, much lower cost capital uh, is becoming more prevalent. Yeah, and we're seeing companies being offered, you know, um, uh, money by um, not only governments, but also by customers um, at levels that they can only dream about. And if this starts to adjust the overall uh, cost of capital for the sector, that must play out in terms of valuation frameworks. And you know, where we've seen this already um, uh, play out is in the utility space here. You know, the moves to decarbonize the utilities sector, moved away from fossil fuels to renewables. The companies that have done that have seen a dramatic transformation in terms of the multiples that they trade on. Um, I think if the resources sector follows the similar path, you know, decarbonizes the supply chain, gets access to lowest cost capital, that will be a driver of multiple expansion. Um, and I think that people will start to recognize the essential nature uh, of this uh, of this industry uh, relative to the needs of the world. Um, so that's the kind of the, the opening comments with regards to the, 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 the macro. Uh, how have we done? This year has been a bit of a disappointing year. It's been a negative return um, for the sector, which has obviously been disappointing. Um, at, at, at this point, you know, some of the kind of the, the big moves that we've seen in some of the more in the broader share prices have seen these kind of downwards moves um, for the year as a whole, are partly um, due to uh, you know, slightly lower commodity prices than have been expected, um, but also due to a little bit of cost inflation impacting margins um, as well. Uh, and this obviously has been you know the background that we've been working with. So the numbers are only small in the scheme of things, but relative to broader markets, uh, I guess. Uh, uh, a, a bigger, a bigger mess, uh, which again has been frustrating. Uh, nothing to do with you know uh, poor operational performance in, in in the underlying companies, more to do with just a, I guess a compression in multiples um, that's been that's been you know I impacting valuations, uh, as I showed you earlier on with regards to those valuation frameworks. Uh, in terms of share price and, and discount to NAV, continuing to trade in that very very uh, tight narrow band around zero, which obviously is encouraging, um, and we. And you know we hope that that can that continues. The board's very focused on on that. With regards to total returns from the sector, uh, as, as Billy mentioned at the start, you know I've been doing this nearly for 30 years. Um, we got our 30 year anniversary coming up in de in December, um, uh, which will be you know, hopefully a, a, a good occasion. Um, but you know it's very pleasing to see that kind of you know 14, 15 times your money uh, return over over that uh, over that time period. Period, and obviously this captures the, the the kind of recent weakness. So if we do start to get some improvement in in outlook in 2020. Um, then obviously that's going to be a, a it could be a big driver to kind of compound this uh, to 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 another level. Uh, in terms of the dividend uh, track record, uh, I think most people will remember the changes we made in 2010 uh, to try and maximize the, the 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 income potential of the portfolio. And you can see the kind of the impact that that has had in terms of overall distributions. 2021 being a particular highlight with that record level of uh, of income being generated and obviously associated dividend. Just to remind um, shareholders. Yeah, the the policy of the board is to distribute substantially all, uh, which basically means you know all all of the income, um, and and that and this uh, and the board the last board meeting we had, which was earlier this month, you know no reason to for the board to be able to change that. If anything, they wanted to kind of re-emphasize that um, to, to to shareholders. Um, in terms of the split, um, you know, the last few years, obviously, we've been heavily dominated by the ordinary dividends with the huge growth that we've seen um, there. As I said, we've got a bit of a headwind um, there. So those numbers are, are like, uh, you know, have been lower year to date, as you've seen in the uh, come income NAV uh, that's published um, published every day. Uh, and therefore, the, 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 the um, diversification characteristics that we've deliberately built into the, into the income mix um, should uh, provide that degree of resilience and support. 
um, for the overall uh, income in the, uh, from the portfolio uh, as we look into the balance of this year and into, into 2024. Uh, in terms of um, 2022 highlights, uh, just obviously that was these are last year's numbers, you know, very good dividend levels, um, good earnings numbers, good dividend yield and, and strong returns. But as we mentioned earlier on, uh, performance numbers are a bit, a bit lower in 2023, which is obviously a source of frustration. In terms of the um, the end September um, uh, kind of update with regards to top 10 holdings and, and asset allocation, um, you can see the, the mix of holdings here in the portfolio. Uh, a couple of comments uh, on this. Um, the first one, I suppose, is to do with tech. Um, this is a position that we had much bigger holdings on earlier in the year, as you can see from the monthly statements. You know, we are a big beneficiary of the of both the company's plans to break itself up, but also the approach by Glencore in terms of you know bidding for the business. We were able to take um, profits quite substantially in that um, during the summer, um, and, and I guess early autumn which has played out pretty well. Uh, I think the company has updated the market with regards to um, giving a, um, I guess, a, 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 some new news um, towards the end of this year with regards to plans around splitting the business between it's coking coal or metallurgical coking coal um, uh, assets called Elk Valley uh, and the rest of the business, which they're calling te tech based metals. So we'll get some clarity on that uh, as we go into into year end. Um, other, um, I guess, news with, within the, the mix, Newcrest, um, that whole business has been bid for by Newmont. So that holding will turn into, into Newmont shares um, when that can, uh, transaction concludes, I think, in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, and so just uh, that's the other bit of, a bit, of, bit of news there. Ivanhoe Electric, this has been a, a pretty successful investment for us in the US. We owned this business privately um, before um, the company IPO'd, uh, and the share price has done extraordinary narrowly well. They've got some really uh, encouraging exploration results and, and early resource numbers coming from their assets in, in the US, but also created a joint venture to explore for, um, uh, I guess, uh, new sources of, uh, of uh, uh, metals attached to the transition in Saudi Arabia itself and some big backing from the Saudi um, uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, into that business as well. So some kind of fascinating uh, times in regards to the kind of in that in terms of security of supply in US, but also seeing what's happened in it with regards to Saudi. And, you know, what, what we've seen recently is the investment by um, the Saudi government into Vale based metals at a, at a very, very high multiple. Um, you'll see Vale there towards the kind of third largest holding. That's a combination of uh, our existing holding in the securities, plus also the debentures we own, which are the, the royalty position. Um, you know, the Saudi government did a transaction to buy a minority stake in the base metals business of, of Vale at a multiple that's more than double that of what Vale itself trades on. So, you know, once that deal concludes, which will be in the first half of next year, this should be a pretty accretive transaction for for the Vale business and generate a lot of free, um, well, a lot of cash coming back um, to Topco. Uh, and we'll wait and see. It was interesting to note Vale uh, increasing their um, dividend uh, and also uh, expanding their uh, share buyback plans at their uh, latest press release um, last week. In terms of the commodity splits, um, copper remains the single biggest exposure by individual metal. We have that uh, large exposure uh, directly, but also our exposure through the, the diversifiers, which is a mixture really of copper uh, and coal and steel making materials. So iron ore and, and, and coking coal contained within in that diversified um, sleeve. Gold around 14% um, of the portfolio mix. And then you know other names in industrial minerals, predominantly um, lithium and uh, rare earths, um, and, and also some uh, in, uh, other industrial industrial assets um, as well. A small exposure to steel um, uh, and aluminium actually becoming of, of more interest given it's a central role. And we've got some, some quite interesting holdings there with regards to the, the energy transition and very, very low carbon uh, production um, assets uh, within, that, within that part of the portfolio. And it would be remiss of me not to mention um, the, the, the position in uranium, which has been incredibly strong for us uh, in 2023. You know, some a large Large exposure there into 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 the, the world's biggest producer, which has uh, which has had a share price that was um, you know would make us wish that we had more of it um, this year. You, 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 when things go up, you never really have enough of them, and things go down, you probably have too much of them. But in this case, we we we, set, we had a big enough position to make a difference. But as always, you do you went know, those kind of moves, you wish you had a bit more. Um, in terms of some updates on our just finally updates on our unquoted holdings. 
Um, everyone, I'm sure, will be aware that Oz Minerals has been bought by BHP. So, um, just to remind people, we made this investment when it was a junior um, that didn't even have a, a project, pretty much. And you know, we ended up backing this business, and and uh, in terms of a very very small uh, Australian listed group um, that brought an asset into production. Um, that business was then bought at a huge premium by Oz Minerals, uh, and then Oz Minerals has in turn has been recently been bought by by BHP. So we've gone from having a royalty on an undeveloped um, copper and gold project in Brazil run by a junior um, to having uh, you know, operating assets being run by BHP. It's been a fairly remarkable um, journey. Uh, I'm going to wait and see what happens next. Um, given the small scale, I would imagine that this is an asset that's non-core to BHP. So we'll wait and see whether what happens with regards to, the, to, the, to that, but um, no insights on that at, at the moment. But it's been a very successful returning investment for us um, with regards to the, 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 the return we've had, I think we've had about a 330% return uh, on that initial investment of uh, $12 million um, that we made in 2014. Um, the Vale, uh, the Vale um, uh, debentures, uh, again, likewise, you know, we, we bought a large position in this in February 2019. Uh, we've had about, um, I think at last count, um, probably a bit more than that, probably closer to, you know, um, 18 reais back based on the 23 reais um, that we've spent to buy that position in uh, in four years. Um, so nearly all of that money back. And I think given, given on a couple of years, we'll have, we will have had all of that money come back to us, um, which has been a, a pretty good journey and obviously these things last uh, forever um, for as long as uh, those assets are continuing to produce and what's interesting with the Vale based metals uh, transaction is that the focus on growth within that business could mean that, that more of the portfolio that the royalties that are attached to moves from uh, development and into production given the focus of value creation um, that the management team uh, are, are aligned on it wouldn't surprise us to see some kind of upside surprise coming through uh, with regards to, to these positions over the next kind of five to 10 years. And that's the distribution curve of returns uh, since 2019 where we bought the position. So we've kind of captured that windfall period um, over those kind of last four years. Um, the last uh, two uh, unquoted that we have uh, in the portfolio, Jetty Resources, this business it continues to uh, move forward down the development curve with regards to building relationships with uh, existing producers and hopefully commercializing their technology um, to be able to extract copper out of areas that were previously thought too hard to be able to get it from. Um, very, very simple technology. It looks like it's starting to be commercialized with a couple of transactions that they've done with Capstone Copper and Freeport. Um, they are working hard in terms of the press releases that have come out recently, um, highlighting um, their focus on landing you know, what they would, I guess you could describe as a big fish. So one of the world's big, large, world-class assets, if they can land one of those, and that will really underpin um, the kind of prospects of the business going forward into the future. So we'll wait and see uh, where those conversations land, but they are very much in, in advanced discussions with some very, very big uh, transactions. So if one of those comes good, um, that would be, yeah, it could be quite encouraging for the, for, for the business. And then MCC Mining is at the opportunity the end of this curve, very early stage uh, explorer um, in Colombia, but got some fabulous international partners uh, and the recent exploration results are pointing to some ongoing success there, you know, clearly elephant country here uh, in terms of the potential, um, but we'll wait and see um, how much, how the drilling goes um, in, in, that, in, in regard to those projects. You know, it's early days, but the, the signs are pointing in the, in the right direction. And we highlight there at the bottom of the page, the last two privates that have gone public. Uh, and the returns that were made um, uh, on those investments um, and, and the subsequent share price moves in the market as they've uh, moved into liquidity territory. Great, I think that's um, the end of the presentation, Billy. So over to you with uh, regards to questions. Thank you. Uh, I will um, try and collate just a couple of questions which are similar. Um, um, so, Emily, just talking about sort of elephants, um, at least hoping to um, get closer to some very big companies that are small at the moment. Um, a couple of questions about uh, Sirius and, and the likes of, well, the likes of Sirius or um, there is a Tungsten West. Um, sometimes it's quite difficult to, you know, get it right. Um, those two not being spectacular successes for, for um, the smaller investors probably. Have you got exposure to some of these really small companies that presumably are 
very undervalued potentially. Um, and, and what sort of what's the smallest market cap um, uh, holding that you have? Um, so yeah, we haven't owned either of those two. Uh, our, the fundamental analysis we did from our technical guys here pointed to. Uh, failures there, um, and both of those, sadly, both of those um, played out uh, as our analysis, um, you know, alluded that they they it could do. So we avoided those two names, despite huge pressure to invest in them by their promoters. Um, so yeah, those were kind of um, you know, thanks to the team here for for the work that they did on that. You know, we we embrace the smaller parts of the market. You know, this is where you can land those you know multiple wins, and you know, I, I look. I mentioned Bravo earlier on, you know, when we invested in this, this was a micro cap company, the same with the Ivanko um, royalty that we did in Brazil, again, a micro cap company at the point of making those investments. But you know, when we make those investments, it's really the geology that has to stack up. Um, and the technical side to be able to you know, show that, that those assets, not only do they have the geological potential, but can they be converted uh, through to you know, commercial success? And, and if that is the case, what's the point of liquidity that we get along that journey where we can you know, extract our return rather than just kind of having ongoing exposure and, and not being able to monetize it? So, you know, we definitely don't get everything right, but the track record over time, you know, we've had a lot more successes than we've had failures. Um, but it's also not just just in the micro caps, it's in the it, 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 or the smaller companies. It's in the bigger ones too, you know. And yeah, there are often times where you you, know, you back a story that has fantastic potential, and something goes wrong. Um, either the you know the technical side doesn't stack up as the asset goes through pre-development work, um, and you have difficulties with regards to metallurgy, recovery rates, payability, and so on. Um, and sometimes you have the opposite. So you know the, the, these things are where you, the diversified approach in terms of having a portfolio makes uh, a lot of sense because you know you're, you're not kind of um, putting out all your eggs in one basket and I think you know we do have that approach where we try and have a little bit of everything across all of the market cap spectrum um, and you know generally through time uh, that approach has, uh, has paid off. Are there any sort of market caps that you you wouldn't go down to? No, I think it's it's it would be wrong for us to exclude things um, because we would have missed out on certain areas of the market if we had done. So if we'd had a minimum market cap, for example, of 500 million, we would never have done Avanco, we would never have done Bravo, uh, we would never have done, you know, Ivanhoe, Ma Ivanhoe uh, Electric and so on, which were all, you know, recent wins um, that we've had that would have uh, uh, excluded us from those processes. You know, we've got a number of um, uh, conversations going on at the moment with, you know, smaller companies in terms of um, providing kind of bespoke finance to them you know that yeah you know, certainly the stories are you know substantially interesting um and we just got to find the kind of right structure for entry points and i think getting a handful of those right over the over over several years that's where you get those kind of big uh, windfalls um so no we definitely wouldn't exclude ourselves but we have to have that visibility of a liquidity event uh in time to be able to to get that exit because those smaller companies are often very very hard to get out of despite being attractive at, at any Entry. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of related is that with, with interest rates higher and financing conditions tighter, mm. are, there, are there many more interesting sort of royalty investments coming across your desk now? Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah no, we. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it definitely things have adjusted. You know, the return potential is higher, but the funding cost has also gone up too. So, you know, uh, we're very conscious of the fact that our debt, you know, has gone from kind of, you know, you know, around one percent to to a number closer to kind of five percent at the moment. So, our our own funding cost has gone up at the same time. So, we've got to match that with the opportunity returns. So, what has been interesting re more recently is we have made our first debt investment for a while where we bought into a, a debt security issued by a company a gold company in this in this case um, that has not only the, a very very high coupon, much you know higher than our cost of uh, cost of debt, but also has convertibility built into it. And I think that that uh, our ability to be able to negotiate that entry point at a at a really really attractive level um, was a was a function of just how difficult it is to get money if you are in that mid cap space. So really playing into the potential um, uh, that we have to be that kind of longer term investor. You know certainly we're seeing more opportunities right now but you know we're also being very conscious that in this environment if things go wrong and you've got higher rates you know things could end up um, bad very very quickly so we're being pretty judicious in terms of the decisions we're making there 
Thanks, Eric. And I don't know whether your PR department would be in overdrive. Um, it's unrelated that you appeared in the RT today, but um, <laughs> in this, in the, well, I assume it's unrelated anyway. Um, in, in the FT, it, it quotes an average PE of the sort of mega cap global miners of eight and a half times versus 18.5 times for the SP 500. Um, I guess how under owned is the mining sector and, and what valuation multiples do you think are fair for a sector that's got, you know, an element of cyclicality and obviously not understanding your tailwinds of the energy transition, et cetera? Yeah, uh, this is something we debate the entire time. Um, you know, I've, I've got you know, uh, you know, three decades of history in investing in this space, and the one thing that is consistent is the cyclicality. So that hasn't changed, and I don't think it will change uh, in in time. The, the thing that is is substantially different today relative to the past is the balance sheet. You know, and I find it very disappointing that with the stronger balance sheets we haven't seen an expansion in multiple you know these these securities are clearly much less risky um, than they have been in the past because in the past the cycle that they go through was amplified by the leverage you take away the leverage and it, therefore by default the quality of the return has to rise and that should be reflected in the multiple maybe that's just too soon maybe six years of strong balance sheets isn't enough for investors to recognize that maybe the falling cost of capital with the result of the energy transition just hasn't reached um, their radar screens uh, as yet you know so i think maybe all of this is ahead of us maybe we will see that you know that, that the expansion in multiple you know the ev but does at kind of four times relative to what the saudi arabian government paid to buy into vale based metals of closer to 10 times you know more than double you know, that's the price that they're prepared to pay for a long term exposure to high quality assets. You know, so just even just one extra point on the broader sector would give a 25% return, um, which would be which would be fabulous. Um, you know, getting back to historic multiples that the sector used to trade at, you know, that would be that would see almost a doubling um, of, uh, of returns from here. So, you know, I don't know what's missing. Maybe it's the ESG lens that a lot of investors are focusing on. Um, and and yeah, see this sector as you know on a backward-looking basis as negative scoring, whereas on a forward-looking basis, as they become increasingly you know low emission and green, then maybe we start to see those multiples expand as it attracts a broader audience. Yeah, I think all of this is is ahead of us. So um, hence, you know, why me, my wife, and my kids are all large shareholders in the trust. Excellent. I'm sort of split between two related questions from your last comment. Was okay. I guess on the downside, obviously you've got to diversify the portfolio, but, but what risks concern you the most and which could impact NAV negatively the most? Um... I think what I would what I used to say is obviously you know a drawdown in, in in commodities demand, but and then that being amplified by the leverage that the companies carry, and if we had leverage on top of that, then that would be a negative. But yeah, that's the bit that's missing. The leverage in the companies just isn't there, and our gearing is very liquid, so we can pay it off in, in short in short uh, uh, duration if we wanted to. Um, but you know, I'd say that the, the the biggest risk factor with regards to NAV is is corporate leverage, um, because that's uh, much more. Uh, much much harder to resolve in the in the near term and that doesn't exist today so i'd say that factor that has historically been the biggest risk factor just isn't there uh, i'd say the with regards to kind of i guess this year i think the short term uh, has been the sentiment around china um, and demand deterioration uh, and i guess a, a move away from residential property market driving commodities demand growth you know i think that very much has been a, a factor in, in in the kind of negative returns we've seen of late but um, as the data which will hopefully show you next year uh, we've got all the data to hand but you know we're just kind of making sure we've got it all right you know we do see this uh, this transition away from the residential market in China more towards the energy transition areas and it'll it'll take I think we see 2026 2027 as a point where you know demand from the energy transition related um, infrastructure overtakes the residential market and net net see, start to see that demand growth playing through at pace you know that's a very very short period of time when you're thinking about the development decision of resource assets which is kind of in many cases a decade or more so you know we, we if this does play out then we have this you know big gap between supply and demand coming through if that takes longer then that obviously will you know impact um things in the short term but the long-term story very much in uh intact in, in i'd say just the one last factor which you can never ignore obviously is geopolitical risk and i think we're at a point where geopolitical risks are heightened right now we've got 
you know, as, as pointed out to me the other day, obviously we've got the Middle East um, situation, which is extremely tragic. We've got a tragic situation in Ukraine and Russia. But, you know, the thing that I hadn't, uh, wasn't aware of is you can now walk across Africa at its widest point um, from east to west, and you can only go through countries that have had a coup um, or at least one coup, many, some more than one coup uh, in the last uh, 36 months. Yeah, and that doesn't get as widely reported as what's happening in the Middle East or in Ukraine. But, you know, we're seeing a heightened period of geopolitical tension and you can never rule out that, uh, hence why the insurance policy of a decent amount of gold exposure in the portfolio is essential in terms of managing risk. Great. Um, if you've got time, a couple yeah. more questions. Is, is on the upside, obviously, valuations are relatively low, but as you say, you know, if, if people get, uh, if they get the benefit of the tax of the ESG and sustainable investing, maybe that means higher multiples. But what obviously your your fundamentals on the ground investor. So what, what real chance do these sort of companies have of, of reaching net zero? You know, there's all sorts of waffle and greenwashing, but and talk, but you know, is there a real chance of them actually getting there? Yeah, great question. Um, I think one thing is for sure is that timeframes are probably going to be elongated relative to the promises that have been made. And I think that the, 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 I say that with, you know, transparency in that, you know, the world needs more materials. If volumes go up, emissions go up. But if the companies take uh, action to reduce emissions, then it, the emissions intensity continues to decline. And I think that is something that people are going to have to focus on rather than emissions in totality emissions intensity is going to be a factor that's going to be you know, uh, given greater attention and i think if we can make progress in that regard then clearly we're, we're, the sector is doing its bit of both both fulfilling needs in terms of uh, supply but also reducing the emissions burden for, per unit of production and i think we're going to see more focus on 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 that clearly the plans that are being put in place by the companies between now and 2030 are very much on track in most cases and in some of them were substantially ahead of plan um you know and i can mention a few names here we've covered a few in the presentation but you know many of the large companies are are actually ahead of plan for 2030 in terms of the the the, the emissions reductions goals that they've had that they've got in place I I think that the the gap between 2030 and 2050, which a lot of them have focused on with regards to net zero, you know, there needs to be an, a number of things to be able to achieve that. You need to see some technological advancement. You need to see some economies of scale in terms of the, the supply of that technology. You're going to need to see offsets to be able to get rid of those last hardest to abate points. But I think the journey of uh, of travel in this regard of reduced emissions is is very much intact. Uh, and whether we get to you know 70% reduction or or even net zero, I think you know that will make a huge difference to the world. You've got to remember that the material sector accounts for 17% of global emissions. That's a massive, massive amount of emissions. And if the world needs more from this sector, if they don't solve the emissions challenge, then all we're doing is we're moving fossil fuels from the from energy generation in terms of them being burnt to just adding fossil fuels consumption to the production of materials, and therefore the world doesn't make any progress. Great. And then um, the final one, which hopefully it won't take too long, but um, one, one of your clearly longer term investor uh, says that flat oil mining peaked around 800p in, in 20, I think it may be since January 21, but I suspect they mean January 2011. And it took 11 years to return to that level. Can you recap on what happened and what lessons were learned to avoid it happening again? Um, yeah, so I put the chart up here on the page and you can see the red element, which is the share price. And you can see the 2011 number has been as rightly pointed out. You know, we've obviously seen in terms of total return, you know, dramatically higher number. So, you know, your total return number in 2011 was 10 pounds a share. Total return number today is closer to 15 pounds a share. So I think anybody focusing just on share price has ignored the impact of dividends, um, which you clearly cannot do. Otherwise, you, you, it's a, it's when you look at the resources sector, greater than 50 50% of returns through time come from income. Um, and what we were not doing enough of back in you know, the early 2000s was focusing on the income potential, um, given that's where most of the returns from the underlying sector came from. So the fact that we've maximized that has really insulated the shareholders from volatility in returns by giving them that additional protection that comes from that higher level of income that we've been able to do. And that has compounded total returns through time. So. 
you know, if for, for that person who asked that question, you've had about another 50% in terms of your total return number since 2011, and, and the majority of that has come from income um, during that period of time. You know, what's been disappointing to us is that share prices of the underlying investments haven't kind of got back to those kind of peak levels in most cases. And I think that's uh, a function of a number of things. Obviously, the lower multiples um, that you can see, uh, as we pointed to earlier on, um, um, just sorry to flick around so fast. Um, yeah, if we go to this slide, you know, back in 2011, multiples were double what they are today. Um, so if we get back to those kind of multiples, then that uh, that person who asked that question will see a share price of <laughs> of, of double where we are right now. So um, and you know, and don't forget, interest rates were a lot, uh, you know, not dissimilar to where they are today back then. So that's not a function of interest rates. Excellent. Um... I mean, thank you so much um, for your time. Really, really fascinating uh, as ever. Um, being one of the foremost investors in this space. Um, thank you, Rob, for dialing in. Uh, and, and please join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. We've got BlackRock Sustainable American Income. Um, so please do dial into that one too if you want to. Um, thank you, Amy. Very great. Kind. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. Good luck. Great.